Um, I'm Lynn Bassanese, the director of the Roosevelt Library. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to the inaugural Hudson Valley History Reading Festival, sponsored by the library and the Friends of the Poughkeepsie Public Library District. We're very pleased to feature authors of recently published books on Hudson Valley history today, and we hope this becomes an annual event. After each of the sessions, you'll be able to buy these fine books at our New Deal store, and the authors will be there to sign them for you. Before I introduce the authors for this session, I just want to remind you that on June 30th, we will be rededicating the Roosevelt Library and opening an exciting, innovative, and interactive permanent museum exhibit. I sincerely hope you will all gather friends and family and visit our new exhibit. I promise you an amazing journey into the lives and times of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, and I have a little sneak preview for you. It is for the new generation to participate in the decision and to give strength and spirit and continuity to our government and to our national life. So those of you who are social media savvy, that is on our YouTube channel, FDR Library, please share it with all of your contacts, get it out there, and let's get people excited about this uh, new museum. And now I am happy to introduce our authors. Um, Robert Titus is a paleontologist by training who has done considerable professional research on the fossils of upstate New York. He teaches in the geology department at Hartwick College. His previous books, The Catskills, A Geological Guide, The Catskills in the Ice Age, The Other Side of Time, essays by the Catskill geologist were all published by Purple Mountain Press. And his lovely wife, Johanna Titus, has a degree in molecular biology. She teaches in the Allied Health and Biological Sciences Department at SUNY Duchess. Robert and Johanna write regular columns for Catskill Life magazine, the Register Star newspaper chain, and the Woodstock Times. And it is indeed our pleasure to welcome the Professors Titus to our stage today. Thank you. if you can't hear me, okay? Well, thank you to the Wallace Center and Cliff Lobby for inviting us here today along with the Friends of the Poughkeepsie Library to tell you a bit about our new book, The Hudson Valley in the Ice Age. Our book came about from our many journeys up and down the Hudson Valley. We've toured museums, we've attended concerts, We've attended events, certainly a lot of events here at the Wallace Center, explored the riverbank, and we've hiked 
most of the trails of the parks and historic sites up and down the valley. So today we'd like to tell you about what we found in just a few of those places. But regardless of where we went, we kept seeing the same thing. Everywhere we went, we kept being surrounded by the story of the Ice Age. It's truly the heritage of the Hudson Valley. The Ice Age defined the landscapes that defined our early view of America. Let's begin by taking you to one of the most historic spots in all of the Hudson Valley. Many of you will recognize it as the Catskill Mountain site, the great ledge that overlooks the Hudson Valley. We've been there an awful lot of times. We would like to take you back, oh, maybe 25,000 years, and to stand upon that ledge and to gaze out at the Hudson Valley as it was so long ago. You would be familiar if you made that journey. You would see a forest before you of familiar trees, oaks and maples. There'd be spruce and pine. There wouldn't be anything that disturbed you very much. What if you got to live there, not for three score and 10, but for maybe 700 years? The centuries would elapse, two, three, four, and you would insist that the climate had changed, that things were different. You would be very emphatic in saying, you know, winters just aren't what they used to be. When I was young, when I was only 75, winters were cold. Winters were down to 10 degrees, zero degrees, even minus 10 degrees. It was just cold all the time. And you'd be grumbling and griping and you'd be 500 years old and people would dismiss you as a grumpy old 500 year old person who's always complaining about things. And you'd say, summer, summers used to be a lot hotter than they are today. I remember it was up over 100 degrees all the time. Now it gets to be about 72 and just, it just never gets hot. And it snows all winter. It doesn't get that cold. It's down to 31 degrees and just snowing all the time and people would sneer at you and ignore you and they wouldn't pay any attention to you but had you kept records you could prove that you were right if you had kept records of the temperatures you could prove that the uh, winters had become not as cold as they used to be the summers were not as warm and if you kept records of snowfall you could prove that every winter it was snowing a lot more than it had been and you would have that feeling when you saw spring and the snow wasn't going away. It was remaining on the ground, especially in the shadowy parts, longer than it ever had before. The same with the birds, the same with the animals, the same with the insects. Those which are accustomed to living in a warm climate would become scarce. We just wouldn't see them. They would disappear. Uh, creatures who uh, enjoy the colder climate would uh, would appear in more greater abundance. You'd have a feeling that the whole ecology was changing. If you were down here at the bottom of the valley looking up at the mountain house ledge, you would see in August something that you had not seen before. The trees didn't look right. The leaves were small, the leaves were yellow. If you climbed up, you would see that indeed those trees didn't look right. They were not healthy. Uh, they were struggling, and even August wasn't treating them very well. There would be a whole type of weather that you had never saw before. There'd be three, four, five days in a row when you never saw a cloud, when the skies were a beautiful, clear blue color. You would feel a steady wind blowing always out of the northeast. It was a cold wind. It was a dry wind. It would bother you. The back of your throat would be dry. Your nose would dry out. You would be most terribly uncomfortable. You would look to the northeast, you would hold your hand up in that direction, and you would say, you know what I think? I think there's something up there. I think it is cold, and I think it is dry. And you wouldn't know what it was. You'd have no idea what it was. And the years and the decades would elapse, and it only got worse. And you had that awful feeling that you just don't understand what's going on. Our ancestors in Europe experienced this. They saw all this happening. How did they react to it? Did they go to the shaman 
And did they say, Shaman, what is happening? What is transpiring? And did the shaman said, say in response, ah, shaman does not have enough fish. If you go and get fish and bring fish to the shaman, he will explain all to you. And you'd run out and you would get fish and you would bring it back to the shaman and the shaman would give you a story and you would walk away feeling that it was a nice sounding story, but I don't think the shaman knows what's happening. The decades and the years would elapse, and we're on the mountain house ledge, and we would look north in the direction of this illustration. And then one day we'd see something that we never saw before. There in the valley far to the north was something which in the morning was a dark blue and then became as the morning went by green and then yellow and at noon it was a brilliant white. In the afternoon it was yellow and green and turned into the blue as the twilight struck. And we couldn't tell what it was. It was too far away. And the months and even the years would go by and we could see this object, whatever it is, and it's closer and closer. It's getting closer to us, but we still cannot tell what it is. A day would arrive when that object was close enough so we would look and we would, in a flash, answer the question and solve all of our mysteries. We would look into the valley below and we would see that it was a glacier and that everything we've witnessed was the onset of an ice age. It'd be a scary thing. The glacier would move to the south. It would pass beneath us on the mountain house ledge. And then ominously, it would rise up the slopes of that ledge and reach towards the very top. As it ground by, it would carve into that slope and produce, actually sculpt and carve, the great ledge that is the mountain house ledge. We had just witnessed a great historic event, the onset of the Ice Age. Well, that was the origin of what is perhaps the grandest landscape feature in the entire Hudson Valley, the Great Wall of Manitou, the Catskill Front. A 2,000 foot high ledge of rock carved by advancing ice it was there that the famed Catskill Mountain House Hotel was built that attracted the painters and poets and writers who would make the scenic natural beauty of the valley so influential throughout the world. Thomas Cole discovered the potential for art here. He painted Catterskill Falls and Catterskill Clove. This new movement to portray America both its wilderness and its pastoral scenes, became the Hudson River School of Art. He was followed by such notables as Asher Brown Duran, Sanford Robertson Gifford, Frederick Church, William Bartlett, and even Currier and Ives, just to name a few. They all came here to the Hudson Valley, and America's first art movement was born. We are the mind's eye, the human imagination. We can go anywhere, we can do anything. It is, oh, 16,000 years ago, and we're drifting through the sky high above what today is Cairo, New York, and we're heading south at no very great pace of speed. Below us is a wondrous sight. It is the peak of an ice age. The glaciers have been expanding out of the north. We can look to our west and see a Catskill mountain range blanketed in ice, blanketed in snow. We can look below us and see the Hudson Valley Glacier. The moon, a full moon, is rising over the eastern horizon. It's shining against the wall of Manitou and reflecting off of the ice in the snow with a brilliant, shiny, shimmering, silvery sheen. Below us, the Hudson Valley Glacier is uh, again silvery and shining in the moonlight, broken by great black images of crevasses. The ice has been moving south and the crevasses are curved to the south. In the middle of each crevasse, is the farthest south, the left and right, the east and west sides of the crevasses trail behind. They give credence, they give proof to the fact that 
This glacier is moving slowly down the valley, but it is moving. We pause in the nighttime sky and hover above the landscape and listen. If the glacier is moving, there should be an awful racket. It should be snapping and popping and crackling, but there's complete and utter silence. On this night, it is minus 30 degrees, and it's been like that for the last few weeks, and the glacier has frozen to a complete halt. It is not moving. It is not making any sounds whatsoever. The moon rises in the sky, and at midnight, that full moon is directly above us, shining down on this Arctic uh, landscape. Now, the Taconic Mountains reflect the moonlight, and again, with a beautiful, shimmering, silvery sheen. It is a breathtaking sight. It uh, is silhouetted against the night sky. We continue drifting to the south, and slowly coming into view is Catterskill Clove, as it was at this time late in the Ice Age. And the glacier of the Hudson Valley, we see, has peeled off to the west, and a great tongue of ice is rising up Catterskill Clove, being pushed from behind, being pushed by ice that stretches all the way back to Labrador and is advancing south. It would seem that that ice is advancing, being pushed deliberately up the uh, Catterskill Clove. We slowly rise up the clove, hovering hundreds of feet above the ice. We look up and we see that last summer it got just warm enough, so enough ice melted, so that great icicles developed a beautiful uh, drapery all around the edge of uh, Catterskill Clove. And now we gaze up and we see this icy, silvery drapery all around the clove. We continue up the clove, and when we reach the top, we're the mind's eye. We soar straight up into the sky, thousands of feet. And way up there, we slowly turn a full 360 degrees. It's an experience that we're not going to soon forget. We gaze to the west, and we see all of the Catskills blanketed again in ice. Only Slide Mountain in the distant west rises above uh, the glacier. We turn slowly to the south and slowly to the east. And now we can gaze down at the uh, Hudson Valley Glacier just at midnight when the moonlight shines uh, so uh, greatly. It is, as I say, an experience that no human being could possibly ever forget. Well, the Hudson Valley is famed not just for its landscape art, but for its landscape architecture. It was on the east bank of the river that the Livingston family first parceled their shoreline properties and built mansions that overlooked the river with its wonderful scenic views. Oops, go back to that one. Later, families of the Gilded Age, the Vanderbilts and the Roosevelts, joined the Livingstons and their descendants. They all wanted mansions designed to match the beauty of the landscape, which elevated landscape architecture to a new art form in itself. It's not likely that many of them understood that the great bluffs overlooking the river were products of the Ice Age. Many of these homes are built on sediments that formed on the floor of the great Ice Age lake, Glacial Lake Albany. Wilderstein, Daisy Suckley's home, and Montgomery Place are good examples. Both lie on the broad, flat surface above the river. They were built on the bottom of Lake Albany. Carriages once drove up these wonderful circular drives to deliver visitors to these historic homes. How many of them do you think saw a lake bottom as they drove? Other great mansions were built on the tops of deltas that formed at the edge of the lake. The Vanderbilt Mansion and the Roosevelt Home, Springwood, 
were both built upon the Hyde Park Delta that formed when those glaciers melted, carrying sediments into Lake Albany from Crum Elbow Creek. We are the mind's eye, the human imagination. Slowly, we're drifting north, up the Hudson Valley, through what will become Dutchess County. The lake stretches in front of us to the north and left and right. It's about 10 miles across. If we make the whole January journey, we'll have to travel 100 miles or so north of Saratoga for us to get to the end of Glacial Lake Albany. But our journey today is focused at its southern end. So many historic sites lie below us. Not yet. Those historic sites are maybe 15,000 years into uh, the future. We drift along the east side of Lake Albany and look down below us and into the water, and we can see the future site of the Wilderstein home the future site of Montgomery Place. We continue a little bit to the north and we see Crum Elbow Creek as it was at the end of the Ice Age. It was a much bigger stream at that time, bringing a lot more water and a lot more sediment into Glacial Lake Albany, creating a delta which stretched out along its eastern shore. We gaze down and in our imagination we can see what will be here, we can see the Roosevelt home and all of its history, and we see the Vanderbilt mansion and all the history that it will unfold. These homes are, of course, gifts of the Ice Age. Well, the Hudson Valley is also renowned for its paleontology. And the story of the Ice Age wouldn't be complete without mentioning what's truly become the symbol of the Ice Age in New York, the Mastodon. More than 100 remains of Mastodons have been found in the Hudson Valley so far. The first prehistoric remains of any animal found in North America was that of a mastodon tooth found in the town of Claverack near Hudson in 1705. Of course, back then they thought it belonged to a giant and people were in fear for their lives waiting for these giants to come back to get them. And by 1800, people had calmed down about giants a little bit and realized that these teeth must belong to something that looked like an elephant. And so by 1800, there was a mastodon fever, and it swept the country. The first scientific expedition ever mounted in America sent naturalist and painter Charles Wilson Peale to Orange County to find a mastodon. They needed an American monster. They needed to counteract claims from Europe, even the theory of a most renowned naturalist from France that was called the theory of American degeneracy. <laughs> it said that everything in America was small and unimportant and even warned Europeans that if they spent too much time in America, they also might shrink. <laughs> so America needed a symbol like the British lion to proclaim the might of its new nation. And Peel's excavation discovered enough mastodon remains to produce two skeletons. One was mounted and kept here on exhibit, and the other toured Europe for quite some time. The one that toured Europe is still on exhibit in Germany today. This is the one that toured Europe if you look at it, it seems a little large, doesn't it? Mastodons were a very bit, bit smaller than modern elephants are today. What they did when they mounted this guy was to pad the joints so that he appeared much larger than he was. And of course, they deliberately mounted the tusks 
upside down to make it look carnivorous. When this guy was done, they exhibited him in Philadelphia at the American Philosophical Society Museum. And the night before the exhibit, they all had dinner underneath him. But the mastodon I'd like to mention to you today is the latest, most complete skeleton. And it was found in the year 2000, right here in Hyde Park. At the end of the Ice Age, the Earth was warming. The glaciers were melting back up north, leaving tremendous amounts of water coming down the valley. I can't emphasize to you enough how very, very wet this environment was. Imagine the amount of water flowing down this valley, water that had to melt out of an ice cube a mile high that went all the way back to Labrador. That's how much water was coming down this valley. Too wet for trees to grow yet. But wetlands, swamps, ponds, everywhere you looked, and lining the bottoms of those wet areas were the remnants of the forests and the mountains that had been ground up, pulverized, by the advance of that glacier. So what we had was great wet areas all filled with a perfect kind of fertilizer. And so where we didn't have trees, pondweeds and algae managed to grow in abundance. Now into this environment came the mastodon, who had been further south during the time when the glacier was in place here. But it was already getting too hot in the south for mastodons. Elephants don't sweat. And these were elephants with really big, thick fur coats. So up they migrated north following the melting glaciers. And when they got to the Hudson Valley, they thought they were in paradise. Here was all this water that they could cool off in, and all of the pond weeds they wanted to munch on while they were cooling off. Who could ask for any more? But the problem was that they went in, and they got stuck in those soupy, quicksand-like sediments at the bottom of these wetlands. And there they stayed, until we came along to find them. So in the year 2000, a man in Hyde Park, right down the street, decided that he wanted to do some landscaping on his property. And there was a small pond there, and he decided he wanted to make it bigger. So into the pond he dug, and out he came with a bone, and then another one. And then he decided to call somebody and tell them about it. Well. By the time they were finished, he had students from several of the area colleges and scholars from the Paleontological Institute in Ithaca come and they all participated in excavating this great beast from its muddy grave. He got stuck there about 11 and a half thousand years ago. He was between 30 and 40 years old and weighed about 10,000 pounds just your average mastodon. About 95% of his bones were found, and it is a he. And that's a lot for a dig, 10,000 years after this event happened, right? So they were all cleaned and mounted. Only thing missing were a couple of toe bones and a couple of tail bones, and they were easily replaced. And today, he is the Hyde Park mastodon and he is displayed at the Museum of the Earth in Ithaca, New York. We'd like to show you one more thing that we found. And just to show you, you never know what you're going to find when you go out to do research. We were out one day last summer, and we were looking for the shoreline of Glacial Lake Kiskatom relatively small glacial lake 
up in the area of Catskill and Cairo, New York. And what we were looking for in particular was bedrock with glacial striations or chatter marks or both, we were hoping. And we came to an intersection around where we thought the shoreline might be. And there was a wonderful flat surface of bedrock. And we found our striations and we found our chatter marks. And as we were sweeping off the rock to take some pictures of it, this is what popped up. <laughs> and then, a little further down the rock, that popped up. These are, I wish we, we could have gotten better pictures of them, but they're really, really wonderful carvings of FDR and Eleanor. And it just goes to show you that no matter where you look in this valley, their influence is also found. All right. But wonderful. We're, we're still researching who might have done these, and we think it was WPA or CCC workers that were nearby. So hopefully we'll find some more information about them. Well, we end our journey today at Olana, looking south, a view that was planned by Frederick Church, along with several other views that he made at Olana by clearing foliage at strategic locations. But this view forms a sweeping vista, a wonderful image of the Hudson Valley. And we hope that from this day on, you'll join us in seeing the whole of the Hudson Valley the way that we do, as a place we truly like to call a gift of the Ice Age. Thank you. Sure. Anyone have a question? You can stand over here. It's always hard as getting the first question. Mm, then you. it gets very easy. <laughs> Go Hi. ahead, you can do it. Hi, thank you for this great uh, presentation. I was wondering if you uh, would uh, want to comment on um, an idea proposed by Gordon Canale in the early 60s. It was called the uh, Rosendale Readvance, in which the ice uh, moved down the Wallkill Valley. If th that was the case, the uh, water uh, that would be ponded would have extended all the way to New Jersey, and where was its outlet? Um, if you look across uh, from Vanderbilt to the uh, area of West Park, it seems like uh, that area uh, has uh, what looked like a Catterskill Clove, a, uh, a, a um, alluvial fan. Uh, is that an area where uh, this uh, lake drained out over a period of time to um, carve out that uh, valley uh, north of the Chopinek uh, Mountain? Could be. Uh, we're going to be uh, writing a new chapter for the second edition where we take ourselves down uh, the Wallkill Valley, and uh, indeed, there, of course, there is a lake at the floor of that valley, and the valley is a beautifully U-shaped valley, very typical of uh, the advance of the ice. As for the uh, spillway that you're describing, I'm not sure we've seen that one, but spillways we find throughout the Hudson Valley and into the Catskills, exactly as you've described them, uh, there are places where the melting ice produced vast quantities of water and apparently very quickly carved canyons, which many of which are totally bone dry uh, today. So I'm not sure I've answered your question, but it's a ballpark that we have been in. How are you? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, a few years ago I read in a paper about the state of New York doing something, rerouting a, uh, a road up in Cairo. And they were, <clears throat> they had to cover some of the petrified woods, petrified forest up there. And matter of fact, maybe 30, 40 years ago, I did see a petrified stump. Could you uh, elaborate on that? I'm betting that the petrified wood you saw was not from the Ice Age, 
but uh, a little bit older from the Devonian, <laughs> uh, about 400, almost 400 million years in the past. The Catskills are renowned for something called the Gilboa Forest, which is the world's oldest known fossil forest ecology. Not just that we get trees in the Gilboa Forest, but we find all the animals that lived in that forest as well. You may have heard the news recently of some very substantial discoveries which have been made uh, in the Gilboa Forest. It is a world-renowned fossil site. I always like to say that the fossil forests of Gilboa are far more important than any dinosaur hunting site because dinosaurs are just dinosaurs. Gilboa is the oldest known example of a fossil forest ecology. That's important. Yeah. The New York State Museum, along with um, SUNY Binghamton and some professors from England, uh, have gotten together and they're doing a lot of the research and it's ongoing. They're, they're coming back in June to do some more. But they're finding lots of new plants and uh, apparently a new fish species now. So we're looking forward to seeing what they have to uh, show us. I was wondering if the Orange Lake would be a graveyard for a lot of the mastodons, which if it's a rather swampy, flat area. If it might contain mastodons? Yeah, I mean, you found them in high Park. Absolutely. I mean, they've done Absolutely. very, I don't ever heard of any excavations being done over there, but. Um, uh, well, most of the excavations that have been done that have found mastodons were done earlier on when farmers were first starting to till the fields and to actually drain the wetlands to till the, till the fields. Underneath the topsoil, all around here, there's a layer that's called marl that's very limey. And people really like that to use it for fertilizer because it's alkaline and it gets rid of the acidity of the topsoil. So when they dig down into that, that's the layer where they found the mastodons. And virtually anywhere in New York State where there are wetlands or former wetlands, if somebody digs, they've got a really, really good possibility of finding something. We are told that a, a nice mastodon skeleton is worth about $50,000. <laughs> We're also told that it costs to excavate a large mastodon about $50,000. <laughs> <laughs> On the topic of digging things, just down the road from here, Tilcon has a very large quarry. I understand most of the rocks are of marine origin. On the other side of the river, up along the road, you have various places where cement happens to be con um, concentrated. Any particular reason why we got these geological quirks on one side of the river and the other, and how these wound up here and not just spread it all over the place? The skill on this side. Oh, you're going to stick me with that one? Huh? Sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the uh, rocks on this side of the river belong, most of them to something called the Norman Skill Formation, which is a most remarkable unit of rock. It's sandstone, which accumulated as sand, at the bottom of a marine trench that would be roughly uh, similar to the Marianas Trench of the Pacific Ocean. The depths could have been 20,000, 30,000 feet. They really could have been. The limestone on the other side of the river belongs to something called the Helderberg limestone. It's about 50 million years younger and it takes you back to an absolutely gorgeous tropical shallow sea, which if you wanted to visit such a thing today, you would have to go to the Bahamas or the Coral Sea of the Pacific and there you would see beautiful aqua-colored waters, pink sands at the bottom with gorgeous algae wafting back and forth in the currents and it's upstate New York and it's the, it's the Bahamas. Uh, I've heard at one time that the elevation of the Catskill Mountains was much more than what they are now. What was the highest elevation that you might know of? Yeah. Well, late at night in geology bars, they debate that sort of thing. And I, get that in. <laughs> I probably, the best answer to your question, and I know. <laughs> Uh, is that the high elevations were in what today we call the Berkshires. 
They are the erosional remnants of mountains that easily could have been 30,000 feet tall. Uh, the Catskills themselves are a great delta deposit, hardened into rock. And the analogy we make to the modern day world is the Himalayas overlooking the Ganges River Delta of Bangladesh. If you could take that region and petrify it, and then erode away what is today the Himalayas, you would end up with the Berkshires or something that looked like the Berkshires lying adjacent to something that looked like the Catskills. A specific answer to your question, 30,000 feet. I feel very old after your wonderful journey in the past 700 or so years. Can you comment upon what the next 700 or so years might do to this valley? <laughs> oh, oh. We don't make predictions. I like did that. the last. I did the last hard one. <laughs> oh, it's <thanks>. your turn. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> we don't. No know. one knows for yeah, sure, really. Yeah. We've asked the question: uh, When will the next ice age uh, come along? Of professional ice age geologists, I remember once I asked it in a group like this, and he said, "I refuse to answer that question." <laughs> <laughs> if he could, we can. <laughs> but we assure you that it will come. Yeah. <laughs> All right, folks, I think we're going to end it there. Why don't we give them a nice round of applause? <laughs> <laughs>